Okay. <laughs> but uh, I'm a stutter, so I uh, when I uh, hung myself up, it always sounds like a beat machine. So that's <laughs> not so good. But okay. Uh, yeah, she's a great insp inspiration for people who are keen on education. She travels a lot. She's a sup she supervises a lot of people. She's caring. She's an oracle. She takes time for everyone at all times of the day and always looking good. <laughs> With an uh, overwhelming involvement and enthusiasm, I have often wondered what, what is this lady taking? <laughs> so, please welcome Kari. Thank you, Cora. That's a tall order to meet. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> uh, I'm very happy to be here, and, and uh, I'm so excited about this seminar. And thank you, everybody, for yesterday, for, for the wonderful day we had yesterday. Today, I'm going to talk about research-based uh, teacher education. Um, <clears throat> the reason why I'll talk about this is, A, because I had an early keynote on it, and um, it's interesting to see what has happened after that early keynote. Quite a lot of people from all over the world have contacted me, invited me, and somebody has even said, finally somebody talks about other than positivistic research in education in early and speak out about it. So uh, uh, this is a shorter version of uh, that uh, presentation. Some of you have heard it, but I hope that, uh, that uh, it still will be valuable for you. So I'll start looking at, because what I claim is that when the policymakers talk about research-based teacher education, to a large extent, they use empty buzzwords. And what do I mean by that? They haven't put enough content into it. They haven't tried to explore what it really means. And when we are reading and steering papers that the teacher education should be research-based, what does it really mean? And that is what I'll try to provide an answer to. First of all, you can see it's coming up in various documents. OECD in 2005, they said, make the profile of teacher education evidence-based. And that means whatever we do in teacher education school, we should be based on evidence and build on active involvement by the teaching profession in identifying teacher competences. Identifying teacher competences, is that related to research? I hope so. Then they continue and say, ensure that initial teacher education combines strong content knowledge with the skills for reflective process, uh, practice and research on the job, which I read as practice, a uh, uh, practitioner's research or practice-oriented research. Research on the job, look into your own practice. <clears throat> and if we look at Europe, and what do we have here? The European Commission, they talk in 2007 about practitioners and policymakers should also be direct producers of knowledge. Policymakers, producers of knowledge in collaboration with researchers. They go on, both practice-based and theory-focused research can contribute to a deeper understanding of education. So here again, we are coming back again, time and again, to the kind of research taking place in Edite and the kind of research taking place in Nafol. We have it in the documents. Then, what does researchers say? Do they agree with this? If you look at Jean Ruddock, already, and uh, it's late, Jean Ruddock, but she already in 1985 said, Attitudes and habits supportive of research need to be encouraged in courses of initial teacher education. 
And that was quite a bit before we really started to talk about research-based teacher education. Then Jean Rudder came up with it in England. Uh, Kenneth Seitzner from the US, he's talking about, it's time we talk about teaching and not about teachers. And if you look at Marilyn Cochran Smith's development, uh, uh, then you can see that we were in a period where teachers' reflections became the main focus for research. Now we have moved more into looking at teaching and what is good teaching and what they have, and I come very briefly back to that, what they very much are talking about specifically in the States, and Kathy could correct me, that is what they call the core practices of teaching. And here they, they come in. One direction for research on teaching would be to continue the, research, the search to identify such common factors, the core factors, in teaching that are critical for success. And that is uh, mainly work uh, Grossman is doing it, Hammersness is involved with it uh, in the States. And I think it is a big research. They have developed quite a lot about it. And that is that there is a set of core practices that you should uh, develop within teacher education because these have proved, they are evidence-based practices, that they are what teachers need. To what extent, and that is one of my uh, questions with this kind of research, to what extent can you take a practice and copy it from one place to another? There are things that all teachers do, but how we do it, that has to be, I think, uh, 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 it has to depend on the context and the situation. And the context, as, as, as I see it, is a combination of what I would call rhizomatics. Uh, that means you have uh, 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 the people involved, the teacher educator and the students, you have the institution, you have the national framework, you have the heat of the day, you have the room, all these things will influence what is happening, the core practices that specific day. So it's an interesting way of, or line of research that I'm following I'm not quite ready to buy completely into it yet. I need more, I need to be more uh, convinced. And then the question is, does research, if we are talking about research-based teacher education, does it inform the policy? A very interesting paper, and this is a review paper uh, by Slita, he looked at four international journal publications in 2012. And you can see these are central. And all of us who are publishing within the field of teacher education, we would know these journals. Then, to what extent does the research inform policy? You can see here, this is the type of the 196 articles that uh, 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 he uh, uh, found. You can see here, which is interesting, that, that uh, you have a variety of papers. You have big survey papers, probably with a, a quantitative data, and you have small-scale quantitative, re quantitative research that people are doing a, a, a very often within their own settings. However, all this research that is published in the four central journals, there's no evidence of an emerging shared research program or direction to inform policy. So on what kind of research then do the policymakers rely on in developing their policies when there is no common research theme? More, um, there's much small scale research which is not linked to uh, larger research programs. And that is one of the criticisms of Kenneth Seichner in his paper of 2007, where he really criticizes this research that he's so much in favor of. And, okay, so it's coming up here uh, too. So that means, does the research we are doing 
does it influence, have an impact on the policymakers? Or are they very selective in the kind of research they choose to look at and that they used to uh, decide to use in their own policy making? That is what I sometimes think of. However, is only using research into teacher education when structuring teacher education. Is that the only thing we should look at? I think there are other things we should look at. And uh, if we look, and back again, Annalena, we are coming to Finland again. Uh, then you have a, a, a probably the country with longest experience of research-based teacher education. And uh, I like Crockford's and her colleagues' definition and criteria. One, they say the study program is structured according to a systematic analysis of education. That is what we have talked about. Another thing is that all teaching is based on research. Think of your own teaching and your situation in teacher education. All teaching is based on research. Activities are organized in such a way that students can practice argumentation, decision making, and justification when inquiring about and solving pedagogical problems. Students are involved with research in teacher education. And then the last one, students learn formal research skills during their studies. Aha! Here we suddenly see that students become the researchers in a research-based teacher education. And I think that is an approach we should make more of. We claim to want to develop it in our way. We are not there. So that leads us to the question, should a research-based teacher education only be consumers of research? Or should we also make sure that they are producers of research? And I think that is the key question that we have to ask. Because I think we need to be both. Students need to be both. Teacher educators need to be both. One is not enough. <coughs> we had a survey. In, uh, I don't know how many of you know about this group. If not, then have a look at the website. You just Google infoted.eu. This is the International Forum for Teacher Educator Development. It's an, a European group, uh, uh, which I'm chair of the group. We are seven countries, 15 institutions in Europe involved. And our aim is to look at teacher educators' professional development. And one of the questions that we asked in one of the surveys that we had I think this is published in European Journal of Teacher Education. <coughs> How do teacher educators describe their professional learning opportunities? And what are their most important learning needs? Keep in mind, we are talking about here, teacher educators, and I want to focus it on research. Here you have the sample. Can you see that when identifying their roles, only 5% of these more than 1,000 teacher educators around Europe, they identify themselves as researchers? Only 5%. Is that a research-based teacher education? If teacher educators don't identify themselves as researchers? Another thing is, and that is interesting, they identify themselves as researchers, only 5%, but can you see how many say that I'm capable of conducting research? But they don't do. So what's the question then? Why are they capable, but they are not doing it at the same time? Is it because of the conditions? Is it because of the job descriptions? There are things we have to look into here, into the structure of teacher education as well. And then when we look at areas for professional learning, you can see that research skills is one of the main areas also, these are the areas that they really wanted to develop. 
But research skills, you can see, is one of the areas that needed more learning about. Teacher educators want to learn about research. And here we are talking about more than 1,000 teacher educators all over Europe. What do we do in order to help teacher educators learn more about research? We have Edite and we have Nakol. And th 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 that is wonderful. These are wonderful uh, 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 initiatives. Is it enough? That is what I'm talking about. And, and then when we are talking about consuming research and teacher education, if we look at our study programs around the world, or around Europe, are they based on research or based on policy requirements on traditions? This is the way we do it, and we have done it for 40 years, 100 years in our institution. Or that is what the national requirements are. We have no choice. We have to follow them. Or this is what research says we should say. Let's think of what we are doing in our own institutions. The next one is, do we implement any of the ideas from research and core practices when we sit and plan our curriculum? As teacher educators, sit in teams? Do we have research material ahead of us, in front of us, and we refer to that and we relate to that? I'm not quite sure that we always do that. Do we have continuous updating of the pedagogy applied in teacher education? Do we change the way we are teaching? Or do we say, this we have done and it works well, so why should I change it? Then, do we in teacher education design professional learning around complex understandings of practice? Do we give time for that? Do we put it into the job descriptions? Do we plan for it? If we are going to be consumers of research, I think these are questions we have, and the leaders of teacher education programs really have to ask. And are we working with research to find out how an idea, methodology, program works in our practice? Let us say one of the core practices, we want to implement it in our practice. Do we follow it up by research? Researching our own practice, self-studies, action research, and our own work. So do we have then research-informed education? And I like that much better than research-based or evidence-based. I want to be informed by research. I don't want to copy and paste. And these are, two, for me, two completely different things. Do we produce knowledge as well? Then look at our reading lists. I had, a, a, a last year, before preparing for the early talk, I looked at the reading lists of Norwegian teacher education programs. Frightening. Norwegian textbooks. You saw one author very often going again and again and again. Not very much research-based. Little or few international articles and so on. National textbooks, national traditions was what the students read. That is not a research based teacher education. I don't know how you feel, my NAPOL people working in Norwegian teacher education. You sit and you're nodding a bit. Because when you look at it, that's what's happening. Then it is producing research. Who's going to produce research? Here, I'll explain the abbreviations, okay? Higher education institution-based teacher educator. Okay? Those who are working at universities and colleges. As a, a, a school-based teacher educators. And these are the supervisors, the mentors of our students in schools during their practice teaching. We are now calling them teacher educators, school-based teacher educators. That is what you find in the international literature. And then I think students should be researchers as well. So I think all these three should be researchers. 
What kind of research? Practice-oriented research, but also theoretical. So I'm not disregarding the importance of theoretical research. But I would certainly claim that practice-oriented research is more useful. And then, what is the relevance? The relevance would be to produce knowledge of teacher education by teacher educators and not by somebody outside who is researching on teacher education. Inform the policy, teacher education to improve it and to improve work in schools. School-based teacher educators are also involved. So school-based teacher educators as researchers, I call this a profession within a profession. If you send your students out to practice teaching in schools, they have a mentor from school, a school teacher who receives them and mentors them during the practice teaching. Are you familiar with that setup? Okay. What do they know about teaching students who are going to be teachers? They know how to teach pupils, but what about teaching students? We have to work more on that. And I think there should even be involved with research because I think they can improve schools through action research and self-studies. I think they can be co-researchers with us from the university in research and development projects. And that is something that we have started very much at NTNU, where we are working. We are what we call university schools, and we're engaging in projects with the schools. They can also act if our students are doing practice-based research. Those who are mentoring their practice, shouldn't they know how to supervise and help the students in their research? In order to do that, they have to know about research. And then having a shared language with students and higher education institution-based teacher educators. And this is, to me, a link between the theory and practice. So I would certainly claim that school-based teacher educators should also be involved with research. However, it's not that easy. Van der Linde and Brach, they found that these are the barriers to teacher educators doing research and school-based teacher educators doing research. And you can read it here. Look at this. Can we share, can we simplify our work? <laughs> Use simpler language. This is what might facilitate Research with practical applications, providing evidence of the benefits of the research, time to read and use research, not ask them to do it in addition to 100% teaching. Time has to be given. An intermediary at the school level, that means to work with them at the school level, and also pressure from the government to use specific research. That means that this might simplify it even though this I'm not quite sure that it doesn't limit. So just then little by little to conclude, uh, how much do I have still time? Okay, fine, good. Stu uh, uh, students as researchers. I think we should educate teachers uh, who can justify what they are doing. And that means by being capable of explaining what they are doing through theories and research. And not just do it because somebody told them to do it. <coughs> I think we should educate teachers to inform, to be informed agents of their own practice. Agents means that you take a room, you do what you think is right professionally, but because you know you are knowledgeable about it. You can be critical to the changes that come from above, and that means you are linking research and practice. How do we do this? This is just an example of how I think it can be done. 
And this is in the five-year teacher education program. In the first year, and how, now we are talking about how to educate students in research. In the first year, they could observe teaching. However, at the same time, what they usually do in the first year, learn about observation as a research methodology too. Learn about it. Read the research methodology literature. Learn about observation as a research tool. Go on. The second year, it could be that they have an assignment interviewing students or teachers. And that means they have to read about and learn, interview, open, guided, closed, learn interviews as a research skill. Read about it. Third year, move into quantitative methods, maybe to write a survey, questionnaire, complicated thing to do. They should read about it, learn about it, have lectures about it, etc. Fourth year, in the methods course, they have to make a synthesis of what has been learned. But what happens very often when they come to the fourth year and they have the methods course, methodology, research methodology course in the Norwegian program, they haven't had these, and then every, all the language is new for them. But if you give them the language, little by little, throughout, then it is easier for them to make a synthesis out of, out of it in the methods course. And then in the fifth year, to work on their master dissertation, and know they have the tools. I think that is a way of developing research skills and competence within the student. Okay? So, students as researchers, I think action research is a means to link theory and practice, and it has the potential for promoting professional development. NAFOL and EDITE are wonderful examples of this. But we have to take what we learn with us into our teacher education and also involve students and our colleagues. And it has to be implemented in the policy making. So, to conclude, policy papers emphasize research, mostly consuming research, but it isn't implemented when we see the, the curricula of the programs. Lots of declarations on how to produce research. <coughs> Practice less. Students, as I see it, are not sufficiently engaged. I think there are now positive initiatives for developing a culture of research. So I would like to end on an optimistic view, and uh, uh, because I know I have a critical voice to this, but I think we are on the right way but we have to continue and not stop. And lots of responsibilities lies on your shoulders, the elite and NASA students, how to do this your work. Because you have become educated in research. How do you take it forward to your own context and workplaces in the future? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Gary, for an uh, insightful keynote for this morning. And good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Roman Cevaricic. I'm from Masaryk University. And with Lillian, we'll be uh, moderating uh, this uh, next panel discussion. We'll have uh, one hour to discuss all not maybe all topics uh, carry raised because there are so many uh, issues and so many aspects of uh, research-based teacher education or research-informed teacher education. So we will have a lot of time to talk about it. And I would like to, at the beginning, just ask you if you have questions. We will uh, we'll have time, but uh, at the beginning, we will start with uh, comments from two of our invited experts. Uh, Lillian will uh, say a few words as well. So please uh, write down your questions. Uh, 
and during uh, one hour we'll have sure a lot of time to uh, to ask you for you to ask the questions. Sorry, may I suggest that uh, our two uh, panel discussion uh, people, Pavel and Kati, come to the front, yes, please, please. and then uh, and Lilian as well, and then we can do this panel discussion. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes, I'm. Uh, is it you hear, hear me? Yes, okay. Uh, my name is Lilian Pedersen. I am a PhD student from uh, Western Norway University of Applied Sciences. Um, and I'm uh, a chair for this uh, panel discussion uh, on research based teacher education. Um, Kari is presented. So <laughs> I uh, will say a few words about uh, Katie Schulz and Pavel Saga. I could have said uh, a lot about these two people, uh, but I have um, sorted out some sh uh, some, some uh, short information maybe. Um, Katie Schulz, she is dean and professor at, uh, or in School of Education at the University of Colorado, Boulder. Um, uh, but she has also been dean of the School of Education at Mills College in Oakland, professor and direct director of the teacher education at the University of Pennsylvania and she founded and directed the Center of Collaborative Research and Practice in Teacher Education. She uh, has been faculty director of the Philadelphia Writing Project and served on the Empowerment Board of the Chester Opland School. Uh, Pavel Saga is professor uh, of philosophy of education at the Faculty of Education University uh, uh, of, uh, at the Faculty of Education at the University of Ljubljana, Slovenia. He is a member of the ed editorial boards of several international research journals and has stopped it now and has been cooperating with international organizations at the as the uh, European Commission and UNESCO. Uh, he has been State Secretary for Higher Education in Slovenia, Minister of, of Education and Sports, uh, co-founder co and director of the Center of Educational Policy Studies. Um, and in 2006, he received the Slovenia National Prize uh, for Research in Education. Uh, he was also the founder and first president of the Slovenian uh, Educational Research Association. So I think we have three uh, amazing uh, uh, participants in this discussion. So I'm looking forward, forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Lilian, for introduction. And. Uh, I think I'll have to start with uh, using the opportunity that we have American as well European uh, perspective. We can talk about European and American perspective on research-based uh, teacher education. And also we have the aspect of uh, philosopher of education. We have uh, maybe the aspect of anthropology or uh, research uh, based on anthropology in education. So first of all, I would like to ask you how would you define uh, how, how you can see research-based teacher education? Would you be willing to say a few words about this at the first, and then we can talk about maybe examples, about the arguments, about uh, maybe the identity, because uh, Kerry raised 
the aspect of identity, who is the teacher, educator, researcher, or the one who can do research but uh, is not uh, willing to do it because he doesn't need it. So first of all, how would you define uh, research-based teacher education? Um, thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to talk to all of you. Um, I'm, I, not surprisingly, agree with pretty much everything that Carrie said, which tends to be true. Um, and one of the things that I'm most interested in is the, re the relationship between knowledge and practice. <laughs> So in the early days, as Kari was ex describing, we thought that the university had all of the knowledge and they gave that knowledge to teachers, much like we think of the banking metaphor for teaching, teachers teaching students. Um, I had friends who were teachers and when they went to big um, research meetings, they appeared on panels as the expert, the person who was expert on teaching. And that was actually unusual to have actually a teacher speak for herself. We've come a long way in really sort of reconceptualizing this um, relationship between knowledge and practice. And I think one of the most helpful discussions of it is by Marilyn Cochran Smith and Susan Lytle, who Kari mentioned. And they talk about three different relationships between knowledge and practice. Knowledge in practice, knowledge for practice, and knowledge of practice. And so what they mean is that teachers, when they teach, have teach um, using teachers' knowledge. And it's not a lesser form of knowledge. But one thing that's very important, as Kari was saying, is to understand how to document that knowledge that teachers use that's in the practice, that's not imposed by the university, but is in the practice. There's also knowledge for practice. So that's knowledge that teachers need to become better practitioners. And, and you know, one of the ways we're thinking about that now, as Kari was saying, is core practices. And I actually, as an anthropologist, have exactly the same questions about it in terms of, are there really practices we should teach all teachers that are core, or do we need to really think about how to contextualize them or think about how and when and where these um, practices are appropriate, especially as we think across different cultures and contexts even represented in this room. And then there's knowledge of practice. So what kind of knowledge do teachers and teacher educators have of their own practice, whether it's teaching or whether it's preparing teachers to teach? And those two are different, but we can talk about that later. So those, that's, I think, what I would bring as an anthropologist and also as somebody from the US. Um, the other thing, though, that I would add as an anthropologist is um, I heartily um, support what Kari was saying about bringing teacher supervisors or teacher mentors, there's a lot of different words for that, into this um, group of researchers and people researching teacher preparation and becoming a teacher. I would add that um, community needs to be um, added to that equation. One of the things that we're starting to do a lot in our teacher education programs is have students spend time in the communities before they become teachers to understand community practice and community knowledge. And the reason we ask them to do that is because too often, especially in urban settings, teachers begin with a deficit perspective on their students and only can see their poverty and what they lack. And so we have them instead spend time in the community to understand the assets in the community and the knowledge in the community. And we've begun to think of teacher educators as not only the people in the university and not only the people in the classroom, but also the community members are teacher educators and we bring them into the, into the um, teacher education program. And so we bring community participants into the, um, the circle of researchers as well. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would also like, first of all, to thank organizers for this great opportunity to sit in this panel and discuss such important question as research-based teacher education is. Uh, now, I think that we have a problem. Uh, 
not with research-based uh, teacher education, but with the fact that um, we all agree um, curry, uh, uh, with, with Curry's uh, lecture. Uh, Kathy started with uh, this agreement, and I can only join. Uh, in academic discussion, you know very much, very well, I guess, that this agreement is more important than that than agreement. Uh, so here you can find three people who think more or less the same way. Uh, hopefully later in discussion there will be some disharmonic voices and I, I, I really look forward. Uh, now, uh, nevertheless, uh, there, are some, uh, there is some diversity among us and this is maybe uh, our disciplinary background. Uh, so if uh, Kate is in anthropology, then my position is in philosophy, not so far away, but enough to make perhaps a little bit different approach to the, to the issue. Uh, actually, my, my, my primary uh, research concern or interest is not teacher education as a such, but higher education, and within it, teacher education. My institution is a teacher education institution and education sciences, so I have had over all my career a lot of uh, possibilities to look into how teacher education as, a, as an academic area is developing. And this is, I guess, the most important issue, one of these most important issues with regard to Kari's uh, uh, lecture. Um, Research-based teaching in higher education has been a must since if I simplify a little bit, von Humboldt, early 19th century. So medicine, science, even humanities and so on, just all disciplines have to be research-based. And what does it mean? Well, actually, we heard. It means that uh, academic stuff at university must work with students with research tools from the very beginning, of course, in a in a sound way. Now, the issue is what does it mean when we come to a specific level of teacher education within higher education? We know, and now I speak mostly for European uh, tradition, nevertheless, this is more or less the same in other parts of the world. Teacher education was not part of higher education in 19th century. The first teacher education departments within universities were established around First World War, or better to say, in the first years after it. So teacher education was considered not, not only non-university, but not university uh, uh, profession. Uh, and this is, I think, very, very important. Uh, in Europe, the, the trend towards inclusion of teachers' colleges, which existed decades ago, into universities, be research-based universities, as we like to say today, or applied sciences universities, this trend actually appeared somewhere in the late 80s or 80s, and then, of course, in the 90s and 2000 and so on. So suddenly, former teachers' colleges working on very, very different uh, uh, philosophy than universities themselves found themselves within, a tra within traditional disciplines like medicine, math, uh, physics, uh, history, uh, languages, and so on and so forth. And I, uh, 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 what I find um, uh, problematic in uh, over the last 20 years, 30 years, during this period of inclusion of teacher education within universities, it is that uh, teacher education was uh, uh, an object of aggressive <coughs> penetration of uh, understanding or if you wish of academic cultures which have traditionally developed within other disciplines and not teacher education. 
Uh, nowadays, I am almost at the end of the career. I'm in the 40th year of work at university. So I know quite a part of the history and a lot of universities and teacher education faculties, departments, colleges, whatever they are called. Uh, um, I think that we could make a typology of these institutions. There are some where uh, mm, disciplines like psychology, and in particular in the Central Europe, pedagogic, I use German word because it can be translated into English, uh, are dominant. However, we can also find other, where let me say maybe in science, or maybe in humanities, or maybe in arts. So the problem which I see nowadays, it is, can teacher education institutions afford simply to copy-paste understanding of what research-based means from another discipline? If you go to, to uh, a, a special and rehabilitation education departments, for example, quite often you can clearly read the grammar of medical faculty. But special education is not only about our bodies. It is about many other things. So basically I think that there is a huge task in front of us, in particular in front of the junior generation, because you will work in the next 20, 30 years, to make a clear identity of research-based teacher education not copy-pasting from other disciplines, why not? Not because I, I would be jealous for them, but because teacher education is a very special area with very special needs, with very special concerns. So for that reasons, we must build something special, as other disciplines did in the past. Lawyers are totally different from medical doctors, and medical doctors are totally different from classical philologists. I think that teacher education deserves to have its own research identity, and we need to do it in, let's say, next 10 to 20 years. Um, thank you both. Uh, my background is teacher education. I don't come from philosophy, I don't come from anthropology, I come from teacher education. My first degree was in teaching English as a foreign language. My second degree was in teaching foreign languages. My third degree was in assessment in education. So I come from teacher education, that is my field. I'm very proud of that field and having that background. And that is not always accepted at the universities because it is no field. Yes, I think it is the field. And and that takes me to, to, to uh, uh, the question with the policymakers, uh, because uh, that is where I see our biggest challenges, not with our fields, but with the policymakers. And uh, Mary and Cochrane Smith, we're coming back again to her quite a lot. She said, as she has repeated many, many times, teacher education is policy driven. And we know that it's policy driven. The framework for teacher education in many countries, including Norway, it comes from above. And that is the framework. We have Ramartala, et cetera, et cetera. We, we have it. Standards are developing, et cetera, et cetera. It's policy driven. Then my question is, what kind of research do the policymakers base their policies on? Is it big surveys like TALIS, PISA, Kim's, Pearls? They have nice histograms and they have diagrams and they have eyes and, and they have data that is easily accessible. They have many more things, but are these read? Are these taken into consideration? And that brings me to the burden that I think we have as teacher educators, those who are working and researching within the field of teacher education. 
how can we make our small scale studies known to policymakers? How can we have a stronger voice? How can we make our research more salient? How can we sell it? Because a collection of the many small scale studies in various places, that is a very powerful voice. How can we bring that to the policymakers so they also can take that into consideration? What responsibility do we have as a professional community in order to do this? Uh, uh, I think that is one of our main challenges. Because we do not sufficiently unite our small scale studies. But that is also a reason why I prefer to call it research informed teacher education. Because we should be informed not only by the big surveys, but we should be informed by the small scale studies too and bring it into our work. And to what extent do we do that and bring it to the policymakers? Because they read Talis and then they say, okay, Norwegian teacher educators, so they say they don't have enough professional development things, let us make sure that they get it, okay? Practice, we have the practice turn, more and more practice is decided, let's leave England now, I'm quoting, let's leave teacher education to the schools. Pat, you would know that, okay? Three thirds of, uh, two thirds of teacher education is in schools, where there is no uh, 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 infrastructure created in order to build it up. These are policy decisions, and they are forming teacher education. Are we taking our responsibility strong enough? Are we ready to go into a critical dialogue with the policymakers? Can we reach up? I think that is part of the responsibility that I think you as upcoming researchers and powerful people, knowledgeable people, you have a challenge there. You have a task there. That is, for me, an extremely important message to bring forward. Thank you. Uh, when I was uh, yesterday uh, moderating also the mix uh, group uh, session, I was uh, very lucky that all four papers uh, of our uh, Edita and NAFL students were motivated to change the practice somehow. So they use action research, they use intervention study, or even they uh, use questionnaires. They wanted to use questionnaires for the sake of the teachers. So I think that uh, our uh, students are keeping in mind this uh, will to, to slowly change the practice using the scientific method or using the research. But uh, I'd like to continue. Maybe there is uh, there are so many papers on uh, the gap between the research and uh, practice, between theory and practice. Fred Kordhagen is one of the uh, most uh, cited author, and his uh, metaphors and his uh, work on this gap. So is. Uh, the research-based teacher education, a medicine, how to uh, make this gap uh, smaller? Is it, uh, do you think that, is it enough just to have uh, research-based teacher education or do we need to have like continuous uh, research-based professional development for, for teachers? Because if I uh, uh, read some of the papers of our uh, editor students, Sometimes uh, when they study teachers, there are, uh, they know that not only uh, uh, <coughs> teacher education is policy driven, but their practice is also policy driven. So they, therefore they are much driven by the Minister of Education and they don't have time to do research or to read research. So do you think that uh, we should need some, some kind of continuous a research-based professional development? Um, the answer to your first question, I think it is clear, it is no. We need more. It's, the task is too complex. 
to be responded just by, let's say, my department produced 100% more uh, publications this year. Uh, this is not necessary. I mean, most often this is this is uh, rather a bad uh, news. Uh, the question is how, of course, how research is transferred to practice. But it is again not the only question to, to, to my understanding. It is also the question how much researchers understand the practical needs. And not only the practical needs, but also practical problems. The needs uh, uh, ex uh, expressed by, by uh, practitioners. Uh, of course, you need to respect them. But quite often, these needs are ideological. These needs need additional critical analysis and so on. Like, for example, nowadays, I just a couple of months ago, I was uh, at a conference of uh, uh, a teachers' union in my country. And what was the main uh, need? Uh, how to re-establish the authority of teacher? That's OK. I mean, it, that's true. However, there were a lot of illusions about this issue. We live in a society which is as it is, and we need to look for solutions within this reality. And here I think we come to uh, next point. I, will, I, 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 cannot, I can't address just all of them. I, I'm sure that Kathy will help me later with, with some other. But one which I find very important. Uh, policy, the term policy, is not necessarily linked only to the National Ministry of Education. Policy, uh, in many languages, non-English group, uh, we do not differentiate between politics and policy. Is it that you understand? You know, you know that fact. Yeah. Uh, so for that reason, in my language, I like to use the word strategy or mission, if you wish. This is not the same, but quite important. So policy is not only the national education policy; it is also in the institutional one. Our university should have clear goals and means how to, and of course, ways how to evaluate practice, <coughs> research insight into it and so on, and even schools in the country. So it depends very much on at what level we address these questions. And now what I, what I find as a weak point at my institution, last but not least, starting with it, but also with many others. Uh, Kari asked an extremely important question, and this is the question uh, of the relationship between uh, research, research output, and uh, policy makers on the other side. Uh, there is very, very little uh, 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 mm, public policy analysis in study programs at teacher education institutions. But this is important. If I compare, uh, uh, let me say, those teacher education institutions which I know best in my country and in near nearby countries, then there is very, very few courses or content in, in study program which address the issue and the methods and the approaches of the so-called policy analysis. So, we miss this. On the other hand, this is quite strong at some social work departments, because they are perhaps more closely related to departments of sociology or political sciences, where policy analysis has its disciplinary ground. Uh, I'm sure that more knowledge uh, uh, in this field would help to be more productive in the transfer of research outcomes to the policy area. And the second point here, th this relates of course to the question of theory and practice. The second point is, and this comes from my practical engagement in the past years, when I served for eight years at the ministry, uh, I came there as an academic. And uh, I learned many, many lessons which I could not learn at the university. And it is that uh, at universities, researchers, academic people, should not live in illusion that they are conductors 
and that, uh, and that administration in the country, they are just reproducer of what we conduct. The life and the logic of policy and political activity is different from research. I heard some time ago an anecdote, a joke actually, which I like very much, a definition of education reform, national education reform. It is an endeavor which can be compared with changing a tire on your car while driving 200 kilometers per hour on a highway. This is, an, this is an experience which a researcher, I know that research life, I'm a researcher, I know how difficult research life, a life of a researcher can be, but we do not change tires at the speed of 200 kilometers per hour. So for that reason, not only that we should require policymakers to understand our research findings, also us to understand what it means to work on the other side with quite a lot, with irrational disputes within the country, with some political groups which try to undermine rather smart and positive reform moves and so on and so forth. So this is a lesson which I learned and I hope that you understand what is the message. Um, I'll start with your second question and then move on to policy. Um, so, I agree, of course, that teacher education in, um, should include teacher research over the long haul. And I think that one of the changes, you know, part of it is our definition of teacher education. And one of the changes in terminology, at least again in the United States or in English, is that we went from talking about teacher preparation to teacher education. And I think the reason we, we made that linguistic shift is because we wanted to indicate that you just begin to learn how to teach when you're in, teacher, in, you're in the university learning to become a teacher, but you really learn how to teach over time. And so that there's ways that we need to not only support it with, um, support teachers with sort of, um, induction that school districts give, at least in the United States, but we need to help them continue to be researchers on their own practice. And as Kari was saying, give them time actually to do that and give them the skills um, and to form networks. And as a teacher educator, that was one of the things that I did as I formed networks of and belong to different um, networks of teachers to encourage them to do research on their own practice and to use descriptive processes to, for their own practice. So I think that as teacher educators, there's many ways that we can work with teachers to include them to continue researching after their time in the university. In terms of um, policy, I think of the role of teacher educators towards policymakers as a role of translation. And um, since we're all simultaneously translating, or most of you who um, first language is in English like mine is, um, you know a lot about translation. But somehow I think as teacher educators and researchers, we are very bad at, at translation. And so we um, write papers for each other and we forget to think about how to translate it for the ministries. And not enough of us go and work in those kinds of settings. Um, I didn't work in a ministry, but I worked on a school board, which sort of governs a body of schools. And that was one of the hardest things I did, because I had to deal with the politics of policy, and I had to look at how my ideas about teaching and teacher education got translated on the ground in a very, very poor, complicated political community. So I think one of the things that I encourage um, scholars to do who are entering universities is to find ways to stay connected to schools and to communities so that our research is always, we're always finding ways to translate our research. And I think too often we fail to do that. And I'll just say one thing about one example of this failure in the United States is one of the things that's going on in the United States, and I'm afraid it will probably be taken up by the rest of the world because that tends to be what happens, is that we have a lot of, um, we have an increasing number of alternative 
teacher education programs. So Teach for America is the sort of most famous one, and it's now Teach for, I don't know if there's a Teach for Hungary, I know there's Teach for a lot of different countries, but there's a lot of different versions of it. And really the big distinction between university-based teacher education, which is what we call it, and these alternative programs like Teach for America is research. So what we say is that when we justify and we sort of talk about the importance of university-based teacher education, we say that it's because we are, we base what we're doing, we inform our teaching by research. So when I'm a university professor, my work is based on research. It's not based on a couple of techniques that I want to teach people. Um, so that's, to me, that's one of the very sort of important and consequential and somewhat dangerous sort of directions that policy in the United States is going in especially poor rural communities and urban communities where people can't afford to go through teacher education programs because while doctoral programs are mostly paid for, um, master's programs to become a teacher are not paid for in the United States and it's less expensive um, or free to do these other programs. So that's, there are dangers to not translating our work into, um, into language that policymakers can hear and that the, pu the American public or the European public or the world public, the global public can hear and that's something that's very important. I'll be very brief, and I hope that also we can have the audience involved yeah. and a, a bit. Um, in relation to your professional development question, continuous professional uh, development question, uh, I think that uh, um, something is on the move in what we define as teacher education. Uh, Hannah mentioned it yesterday, uh, that uh, there are three phases initial teacher education, induction, and in-service. In Ireland, even before EU, I think, came to it, they had this as a, a, a policy decision, political decision, and it was the uh, Irish Teaching Council that uh, it pushed it through to the policymakers. That when we talk about teacher education, we talk about initial teacher education, we talk about induction into the profession, and we talk about in-service professional development. I think it should be the same for teacher educators. So, uh, so and you mentioned this yesterday, Hannah, in, in your presentation. Uh, but then when we talk uh, about uh, teacher educators and, and uh, they are kind of research, uh, then uh, because we are working in higher education, as you say, we have the pressure of publication and you feel it, you are in the midst of it, the pressure of publication. And, and then the question is, do we have time to research and publish? Or could we do, and I just had a talk about this at my old university, the University of Bergen last Friday, can we combine it? And I think that if we really want to improve practice, we have to combine research and a, 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 a teaching, our own practice, and publication. And you mentioned it also, that is, we have to articulate, we have to do our self-studies, or we have to do our action research in such a way that they meet the criteria, the quality, uh, the quality criteria for research and for publication. And that means that if a team in a teacher education institution goes into a self-study project, for example, about how they want to improve the relationship with school, with their practice schools, with their partner schools, then why shouldn't they do it in such a way that they also research it and they publish the findings? I would say that yeah, most of my publications, it's that kind of publications. And, and, and you have lots of journals that are going for it, the four journals I've shown, lots of other journals, studying, uh, teaching, uh, teacher education, it's a self-study journal, highly accepted journal, 
and you have Action Research Journal, you, you have so many journals which would uh, welcome this kind of publications. So I think we have to go with that. Because to me, research and improved practice, teaching in teacher education, goes hand in hand. And I don't see them as two distinct, uh, distinct uh, that have to compete with each other. Okay, thank you. Uh, as Kerry said, uh, the NAFL and EDITA are the programs, are the examples of uh, programs research based uh, teacher education. So I think it's time for open uh, space more for your questions. So if you have any questions regarding uh, research based or research informed teacher education, please raise your hand. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. So I want to ask two questions. The first one is related to the identity of teacher educators. So you connect research to uh, around the identity of teacher educators, but do you think that this identity, this professional identity is widely recognized within universities and also at the policy level because the role of teacher, I mean, teacher education in general seems to be fragmented, and the role of um, the identity of teacher educators is also rather fragmented. So, professors who teach uh, mathematics or didactics, um, or even teachers like mentors, they don't necessarily feel themselves as teacher educators. So, is there a purpose somehow to foster this uh, common professional identity in order to promote this goal of? research-based education and how can we do that? And the same goes for schools because sometimes when I talk to teachers, they say that nowadays we have to be uh, teachers, but also psychologists, uh, social workers, uh, and, and nowadays also researchers. And uh, if you consider that some countries allocate very few resources to education and professional development in general, so how can um, you know, engage teachers and motivate them to, to see that there is a benefit actually um, doing research. And, um, and yeah, the last thing uh, was connected to what Kai already said, but maybe the other panel speakers could reflect if there is a risk to somehow um, overemphasize research um, instead of teaching in the sense that quality assurance in many universities values research and not the quality of teaching and is there the role of uh, somehow teacher educators and teacher education of us to somehow promote also this uh, idea that, that uh, the quality of teaching in higher education should be e equally valued and, and quality assured as the research. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, ourselves for a few questions in one. <laughs> so. so we could probably spend the rest of the time and maybe the rest of the conference answering your, quest your very good questions. So I'll just do a, say a couple things and let my colleagues say a couple things as well, of course. Um, you've, you first brought up um, teacher education as a, as a, how is teacher education sort of thought about as a profession? And um, I agree, I'm in a, so I'm dean of a university, of a school of education, and um, it used to be divided up into two, our school of education was divided up into two programs, graduate studies and teacher education. And so one of my first things that I did was to bring those two together. Because I think whenever there is any kind of separation between teacher education and the other um, areas, then there's hierarchy. And so I think that there are sort of intentional ways to think about addressing that hierarchy that you bring up. One of the ways that we're doing it is by um, developing a doctoral program in becoming a teacher educator. 
So becoming a university professor, the sort of pedagogy of being a university professor, including the pedagogy of being a teacher educator, is rarely taught. When I became a teacher educator, which was right when I started my education, nobody had ever taught me how to teach in teacher education classes. And yet we know there's a, there's a lot that, there's a whole research body of work on teacher education. And so um, I, after being a professor for a number of years, I started a course on teacher, you know, on um, research on teacher education, not on teaching. And um, I think that, that sort of area is becoming a bigger area. And I think that's one way is to really think about the pedagogy of teacher education is really important. Um, just very quickly, you talk a lot about, you talked about it, asked about teacher professional identity. Um, again, that's a huge topic, but just very simply, I would say that being a researcher as a teacher is part of professionalizing teaching. So I think that they go hand in hand, and really the question is time. So I mean, one of the things that many teacher education programs are working on, at least in the United States, is professionalizing teaching and, and, and um, finding ways for teachers to stay in teaching, but also to, to um, carry that teacher professional identity. And I think acting as a researcher on your own practice is a very important way to do that. I'll be very brief because I see there are many hands out here. So, so the first thing I'll say is that uh, uh, she, uh, uh, Kathy talked about the identity of teachers. I'm talking about the identity of teacher educators. And uh, as you could see from our survey, we found that only 5% they would identify, identify themselves as researchers. They are for, first and foremost uh, uh, teacher educators. What we have developed in NAFOL, among the NAFOL graduates, uh, they are saying uh, 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 they are researching teacher educators. That that is the way they identify themselves. They are researching teacher educators. That means, in other words, they are teacher educators doing research. And then, very quickly, about InfoTED. Again, International Forum for Teacher Educator Development. No, in the first week of July, we are going to have a summer school for teacher educators about teacher education uh, in Trondheim of uh, 45 European teacher educators uh, 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 coming up. So uh, uh, things are moving on, and that is one of the things. Belgium has a state-funded course already for teacher educators. Uh, uh, the Netherlands are talking about it. Things are happening. A few words on the fragmentation of uh, identity in, uh, among teacher educators and teachers, last but not least. Uh, I think that we need to start at, uh, at the point to recognize that this is the fact uh, in most uh, institutions and countries which I know. And then, of course, we need to ask ourselves why. Why this huge fragmentation. Uh, my uh, thesis, or hypothesis if you wish, would be uh, very much linked with what I uh, told at the beginning of uh, this panel. Namely, this fragmentation is mainly based on different epistemologies and different academic disciplines. Uh, some research uh, uh, has been done in this area, and uh, quite often those who are working, let me say, in math education identify themselves as mathematicians. And those who work in the field of fine arts, they identify themselves as artists and not as teacher educators. So fragmentation means that teacher education has not yet been born, like in the case of Kari which is an advanced level. So we need to fight for identity. We need not only to fight for identity, we need to construct. And uh, why I use uh, the term fight? Because building teacher education as a clear cut area within academic space, university, means that you should 
enter into conflict with traditional disciplines. Teacher educators teach, at least uh, this is data for Europe, approximately 10% of students enrolled in uh, first and second uh, cycle, bachelor and master. So 10% of students enrolled in European countries are in one or another way teachers um, uh, teachers to be, yeah, and related professions also, let me say, school psychologists and so on and so forth. So this is a chicken which brings gold eggs. And know very well that guys at uh, science department, at humanities department, and so on, know very well that these are golden eggs. And when the enrollment of students to their departments fall, then they declare themselves teacher educator. And this is why I would like to encourage you, when the war bells are ringing, take your weapons and defend teacher education. Thank you. Another question? Thank you. Um, you were talking, Pavel, about this um, policy uh, document studies of it, and the, uh, and we don't have those kind of. You don't have those kind of studies. Um, do you have uh, uh, references for that? <laughs> and uh, also, Kari, how is the situation on this area in Norway as well? So it's um, because I'm I'm. A little bit interesting in those um, th that area. <laughs> uh, very briefly, because we don't have much time. Uh, for example, perhaps you know Stephen Ball, Journal of Education Policy. Just check on on the web, and you will find one of the excellent journals in this area, which is interdisciplinary with uh, researchers from the field of education, from political sciences, sociology, and so on. And you can learn a lot from. From there, on the other side, uh, uh, education policy studies are quite often part of uh, out of university institutes, OECD, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I think, uh, uh, and almost in every country, I know that there is something uh, a think tank working in this field. What I th uh, the think is important it is that uh, teacher education units, departments, faculties, whatever they are, should make good relations and cooperation with this kind of institutes in a country. And then this would empower the, uh, let's say, ordinary work of uh, teacher education institutes. Thank you. Just very briefly, uh, we have Nuket in Norway, and that is probably not the best dialogue partner we have. <laughs> so we are more in opposition than being in discussion. I know. I want but to we come back to that tomorrow. I, believe. I want to ask about uh, policies and strategies, and this is a question to Pavel's Gaga. And uh, uh, a part of my research, auction research is also document analysis of uh, roundtable discussions that we had in Poland about uh, education and this was a time where we could uh, completely create a new system and my wonder uh, at the beginning was how is it like, like after almost 30 years of democracy in Poland schools are still not fully democratized or sometimes at all uh, so I had this, some conversations with some former policymakers, and uh, just what you said is completely true in Poland as well, with this uh, clash of uh, professors going and uh, being in position of uh, changing, thinking that they can change, uh, but it's not possible. So my question is, uh, how um, how do you think it can be? Can it be changed? So so the policies are not reactionist. So the the researchers, uh, practitioners, and policy makers or strategy makers can make it actually happen. Welcome to the battlefield. <laughs> uh, uh, 
sh shortly, and maybe we can extend this during the coffee break later. Uh, mm, we should not expect that uh, policymakers and politicians in the second round will take our research outcomes as technical neutral elements. What we produce as research outcomes always, let's say, have certain impact on the existing social structures. And we need to think about that. Yeah? So you need to position, you need to contextualize your research outcomes with regard to trends in your country. If you want to have an impact, yeah? Uh, secondly, you must work together with your colleagues. You alone, you are fired. And thirdly, I think that with all people of, let me say, enlightened brains in the country, regardless differences among them in political approaches, whatever, educational uh, theories and so on, should agree on a necessity of a national forum which discusses these issues. I think that this is most important. And this is the point where, for example, I admire Finns. Yeah? And some other countries too. This is a stronger forum you have, and the more tolerance you have to somebody who thinks differently from you, as better results you have at the end. So we need to work also outside our research rooms to make our research, uh, let me say, a real impact to our societies. Um, so my question is more about the how are we going to do that, introduce it to teacher education. And I'm a teacher myself. Um, and I just feel that this very strong division between being a teacher or being a researcher, I'm not sure that this is um, the way to go about it because I believe if you're a teacher you do a lot of things that are part of being a researcher. Of course the conceptualization is different and the aims are different and um, going into a profession of being a researcher is different but if you think about don't teachers do observations it's you have to observe your students um, or if you think of interviews as dialogues or being receptive to voices, you do that as a teacher. So I think there's just so many things that are naturally part of being a teacher. And I'm, th I'm just thinking if we rather approach this as bridging um, these conceptions rather than saying teachers have to learn another profession, while it's kind of already a part of it. So what do you think about this, maybe, Kari? I'll do this. Firstly, I strongly agree with you. And I just want to tell you about something that happened the day before yesterday. I got an email while I was sitting at the airport in Amsterdam waiting for the flight here uh, from somebody I, I didn't know. And it started, Dear Professor, I'm writing this in response to your paper, or as a follow-up to your paper from 2015, okay. And there he said, you are talking about teachers as researchers doing action research, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and I very much agree with it. But in their daily work, teachers are researchers. They have to research and think how to plan the lesson. They have to assess and analyze and interpret the assessment they are making, etc., etc. He came with various examples, wonderful examples of the teacher being a researcher. And he said, please, in the next paper, could you also bring that into it? I, I've asked him this morning uh, to, if we could publish this on the InfoTed blog on the website because it was so well taken. He agrees with you. <laughs> and I agree with you too. Um, I think one difference, one sort of tweak 
is that um, one definition of practitioner or teacher research is that it's systematic, intentional research. And so I think while as people, you know, I'm, again, as an anthropologist, I'm always sort of like understanding the crowd and reading the crowd, I'm, I'm researching, but it, it's different if I make it systematic. And, and I do think that teachers don't need universities to come in and teach them how to do it. Um, when I was 22 years old and a beginning teacher, I was part of a teacher group that now has gone on for over 30 years. So I sort of entered it and it's continued. It's a group of teachers that meets every Thursday and they use inquiry processes to look at one single child at a time. And so they're doing, and when one person presents this child and everybody helps that teacher think about it. It's Thursdays at different people's houses. It's not, induct, it's not formal induction given by the district. It's teachers doing research with and for each other. And so I think there's a lot, we don't need to have universities bless it or define it, but I do think that there's a way in which teachers can be intentional about their research and that isn't adding a burden, it's actually paying attention to what they know. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that distinction between knowledge and practice, that it doesn't just come from the universities, it comes from the teachers as well. Okay, I'm the moderator, so I can have the last question. Uh, No. <laughs> Thank you very much. Because I wanted, is it okay? Because it was only 15 minutes? We had 20 minutes. I, I calculated it was 15, really. Is it, is it a problem? I can ask later on, but maybe okay. some if other Okay, if you have one question, question, please ask. Yes, I have just one. Because uh, I wanted to ask to Pavel Gaga about the, uh, because I also agree that the teacher education is special in a way that it should have a special approach to research, but I'm curious about your opinion on the focus on this research, because from my uh, experience, it should be the teach everyday teaching practice that should be in the center of the teacher's research, but I w I'm curious about your opinion. Thank you. Well, I, I think that it is impossible to give a clear answer uh, today to your question, that we need a little bit more time. Uh, in my, my, my expectation is that maybe within a period of 10 years this, this question will be more clear. I would refer here to uh, a famous American uh, researcher of higher education, Burton Clark, who uh, some 20 years ago, I think, uh, discussing teacher education uh, institutions, uh, said, we need a lot of experimentation in this field. We don't have the best practice yet. Yeah? So... We will, we will never get it. And we never get it. Because there are uh, differences in this field. So what we really need, it is experimenting, experimenting. Not in the sense of positivistical uh, uh, approach, but experimenting with models, with social communi with communication, social networks, and so on. And getting together like here, every year, again, exchanging among us. Uh, this is what actually makes an academic era, an academic discipline. Medicine, if you look into 800 years since Middle Ages, went the same path. And I think that we cannot avoid that. So we need to take more time. And I hope that <laughs> the, the new generation of education, teacher education researchers will be able to claim one day what it is. I can't today, too early. Thank you. And my last question, because uh, uh, we can see that uh, there are so many questions and we can talk about it uh, during the coffee break, but I was thinking if uh, you plan uh, to write a paper on uh, research-based teacher education, all three together? It <laughs> sounds very, I think maybe collectively there's a lot of knowledge in this room. <laughs> I think I've written quite a few. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but uh, only uh, under one condition, if you give us some three, four years' time. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for our discussion, and thank you for your question.